Hello, everyone, and welcome to the program. This is Sunday Politics on Channels Television. I'm Sean Kimaloye in Lagos. So, since last week, Sunday, when we hosted the governor of Kaduna State, Malam Nasir Arifai, some of his statements and interventions have generated controversies. Things went so heated that the Nigerian Bar Association withdrew its invitation to the governor to speak at the annual conference. The governor spoke about the security situation in, uh, in the state and in the country, and uh, he has since replied the decision of the bar to disinvite him. The governor, in a statement, said, and I quote, the circumstances of the last few days warrant some comments that a professional organization has elected to endorse a one-sided narrative on a profound national issue is something that its members may wish to reflect upon for an association whose breed uh, bread and butter is about justice to make a ruling based on the stridency of people who lampoon judicial processes against certain individuals without hearing the other side is odd it bears noting that in its response to pressure, the NBA leadership has signaled an unfortunate embrace of injustice, unfairness, absence of fair hearing, and total disregard for the rule of law. The president of the NBA, Mr. Paul Osoro, has equally responded to the situation, especially at the comments from the governor of Kaduna State. Mr. Osoro wrote, and I quote, he says, As the NBA president, I take full responsibility for the unintended embarrassment and tender my regrets and apologies. As an elected national officer of the association, I am personally answerable to neck and cannot overrule his decisions even if I have dif different viewpoints and positions in regard there to TCCP as an MBA organ is, an, uh, is in precisely the same position and the same applies to all other committees of the NBA, end of quote. This has escalated badly too and divided the Nigerian Bar Association. Some branches of the NBA have since reacted to uh, some of these issues. Uh, some of them have threatened to boycott the conference. Today, when the former mayor of Kano, Sanusi Lamido, who was also the former governor of the CBN, visited the governor, he made comments on the situation as it affects the security situation in Kaduna State and governance under Mr. Erufai. But we get to what that is coming in a moment. Let's take a look at some of the issues that have been raised uh, in the last few days. I'm being joined by a senior lawyer in Nigeria, Mr. Chino Obiago. He's a senior advocate of Nigeria. Thank you so much, Mr. Obiago, for coming tonight on the program. Thank you, Sharon. I wanted to listen to what um, the former mayor of Kano said on this matter, and I'd like to get your reaction to, to that. Take a listen to what he said, a mayor of, uh, former mayor of Kano, Sanusi Lamido. The governor of Kaduna State is not doing well. You should invite him to your conference and ask him. And let him explain what he is doing. And tell him what you think he's doing wrong. You will learn something from him. He will learn something from you. Um, disinviting him is not the path of people who actually want progress. Because if you disagree with someone, having him in your hall where you can tell him your view is the best way and he can defend himself and if uh, there are things that he needs to improve he will take them on board and if there are things that you don't know that he's doing you can be better informed that is i think the best way uh, to handle uh, issues like this um, but again um, i have seen the response from different branches of nba i i hope that this matter will not be turned into a religious and ethnic matter. It should be a matter of principle. Senior Advocate, what do you make of the statement of the former mayor? Well, I think NBA is a pressure group. And the motto of NBA is to promote the rule of law. Remember, it is not just because of the killings in Southern Kaduna that uh, NEC took a decision to disinvite uh, His Excellency Governor El Rufa, the governor of Kaduna State. It's also about consistent disobedience to cut others. And the motto of MBA is to promote the rule of law. We expect that MBA should not allow in its fold anyone, a member of the executive, that consistently disobeys court order. Now, in addition to that, being a pressure group, they have a right to decide who they invite in the room where they're having a meeting. And if MBA says they don't want 
Mr. Rufai, then they should give them the opportunity. I mean, they should give, you know, allow them to take that decision. I don't think it's something that Mr. Rufai should, you know, grovel about or his um, spokesperson should criticize MBA for doing that. Because the key issue is uh, NEC has taken a decision on that. But why did you invite him in the first place? Well, like the President Tussauro, uh, President of MBA said, uh, the Technical Planning Committee made that decision without reference to NEC. And they have brought the program of the event to NEC meeting, that this is the pre-conference NEC meeting. And the NEC meeting is supposed to take a decision on decisions, on, uh, take a final decision on the recommendations of the planning committee. And having looked at the program itself, it, that is not the only way, area that is tinkered. They have then has the power to say, well, we don't want this person, we do want this person. Of course, you know that at the meeting on Thursday, they were divided opinion. People say have people voted against and, and for. Uh, but the majority of members of the NEC opted to disinvite him because of what is happening in Southern Kaduna and also the disobedience of court orders. Uh, the basis at which Mr. Erufai was, uh, the, the conditions or uh, the reasons uh, NEC gave or those who petitioned uh, the technical committee, the planning committee, uh, over his invitation, uh, those bases were, were they of uh, optics or were, were they substantial cases uh, against Mr. Erufai? Well, I think they are very substantial, my own personal opinion. Um, we've seen what one can even consider as a genocide in Southern Kaduna, and running over several, several years. And we've seen a governor that has been in second, he's in second term, who has done nothing, let's done nothing to curtail the killings. Would it be Southern fair Kaduna. to say he has done nothing? About no, I said little or nothing, because we, are not, we don't have records of people who have been properly investigated, prosecuted, for huge, massive, and systematic massacre going on in Southern Kaduna. I mean, it, 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 is, it is very appalling that a village would be raised down in a state where a chief executive is the chief security officer, and we don't see concerted effort. We don't see, um, you, know, you know, a commitment, a, a, good, a good faith commitment to bring to justice those responsible for those massacres. And they're going on up to today. So how will MBS, a pressure group, justify bringing the chief executive that has taken no stand, that has not fought massacre, genocide in his state, into his fold? Now, disobedience of court orders. We have people who have been in detention arising from Kaduna. Just a moment. Yes. Let, let's touch on the issue of security because I spoke just last week, I spoke with, uh, just about this time, I was speaking with the governor of uh, Kaduna State. And one of the things that he said was that uh, the situation is an age-long matter. And th that matter, uh, I asked him a few questions about his decision as a governor and the government of, uh, of Kaduna State in uh, curtailing and ending the crisis, the security situation in uh, the, the state. Uh, but he, he also made it clear, uh, or he said on the program last week, that um, it's not, uh, a Kaduna State is not the only state confronted with this issue. Zamfara, Sokoto, and other states in northwestern region of the country are experiencing this. So would it be fair to say he has done nothing? We, uh, it, would be, it would be fair to say he has done little or even nothing. Because remember that he's been judged in the court of public opinion. And the public opinion is so overwhelming. When this issue came up in the NBA, 1,500 people, 50, 50, uh, 1500, uh, people endorsed that he should be disinvited within three days. It is very remarkable. Now, I, I, don't compl I know that this is secrecy across Nigeria. I know there's a lot of criminality. But when a, a particular sect of people, the Southern Kaduna, are targeted, what happened to other parts of Kaduna State? What, happened to other, what has the governor done to secure the lives of people in that area? That is the question. And he, the, the, the space is there for him to say what he has done to do that. You know, I watched the program last week, and there's nothing concrete that he has said he has put on ground. Now, if you see, uh, on a daily basis, people, in your, people you are ruling are being killed. What have you done to do that, to, to, to stop those killings? That is a critical question. And the MBA is a pressure group. Remember that. MBA is a pressure group. The MBA is a pressure group that is there to promote the rule of law. Has the right to decide that we need to make a statement on this. We need to demonstrate that we, we, we don't have support this kind of massacre. Does it necessarily mean that the NBA was right in this, in this case? Well, I think the NBA as a project was right. 
you know, I, I'm a member of NEC, and I, I know the debate was robust. People, there was a lot of arguments for, for and against. But, but I, I think the NBA is right. I personally also think that they should, NBA should have gone further than Erufa and disinvite people, everybody in government that has supported the disobedience of court orders. We lawyers, we, we believe in rule of law. And what is rule of law? That everybody is equal before the law. That the judgments and orders of the court must be obeyed. But did the, uh, did the neck consider disinviting other people? Because some, uh, like Jigawa State, some Northern Kaduna State, NBA, a few other states, uh, association, I mean, uh, branches of the NBA, have said that they, they will boycott the, uh, the conference on this note. Uh, this has divided the NBA, isn't it? Is it good for the NBA? Uh, well, we had 120 branches of NBA, and the National Executive Council Committee is the national body of NBA, so it's the highest decision-making body of NBA, apart from the general meeting. So if branches opt out of the, you know, opt out of the conference because of this issue, NEC has a power to sanction them, because NEC is actually NEC that created those branches. So if NEC takes a decision and a branch goes against the decision of NEC, then they can come back and say, well, you have to explain to me why you need to go against the decision of the body that created you. But for some of your colleagues who believe that Erufa is a governor that was invited, other governors also, uh, they have been always picked in their invitation. Uh, did NEC consider disinviting them the same way they did disinvited uh, Mr. Erufa? Oh, well, that's the point I made earlier on that I, I would have gone further if I was the president of NBA. And uh, for us, uh, I, mean, I must say that the apologies of the president of NBA is completely unnecessary because NEC has taken a decision. Making an apology does not arise at all. Now, I would have gone further to disinvite people like the Attorney General of the Federation because we have on record more than 50 decisions of the court, orders of the court that have been disobeyed by this government. And how will you get the Attorney General of that nation to come to an NBA conference? The Attorney General that says that national security takes precedence over the rule of law and human rights. You don't say that in a nation with lawyers, because the lawyers are there to promote the rule of law. So they would have gone ahead to disinvite governors who, in their domain, there are a lot of killings and insecurity, and they're doing nothing. I'm not saying that the, I mean, the governors can go, go, go stop insecurity in a day, but they need to demonstrate that they are fair, and they're treating everybody in their state equally, and that they're providing security for all citizens in the state. And unfortunately, that is not the situation in Kaduna State. All right. So you heard what the former mayor said, that uh, he, he, he thought that the NBA would have given Mr. Erofi the opportunity to come in the room and be asked question, and he's being given opportunity of fair hearing on what he's doing. And if he's doing anything right, he might be able to be commended. If he's doing anything wrong, he might be asked and might exchange knowledge on how to do better. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, do you think that the NBA could have allowed Mr. Erufai in the room and be questioned on some of these governance decisions that he has made and policy decisions? Well, Shell, NBA is not Shell's television. Shell's provided a platform for Mr. Erufai to do that last week. He did not. NBA is a pressure group. They said that they did that, they took that decision to make a statement that Nigerian Bar Association in this new regime will not tolerate accommodating or, you know, romancing with people who abuse the rule of law. That is his statement. It's a pressure group. So NBA has said it and it's like, it's like an NGO making a, doing, undertaking a campaign. And that statement should send a signal to all Nigerian officials who think that because of immunity, they can, can, they can get away from constitutional immunity, they may not get away from the immunity from prosecution in the court of public opinion. And I think that's a very strong statement. I mean, we remember the time of Akaba Sharu, for instance, under the military. Remember the time of, you know, San, people, president of Nigerian Bar Association, who is saying no to any abuse of human rights, any abuse of the process of rule of law. The NBA in this country has boycotted the courts because the military has taken a wrong step in prosecuting people who are alleged to be, you know, um, corrupt. So, NBA has always consistently, except recently, where the Nigerian in politics of Nigerian Bar Association has already gone uh, awry. NBA has always stood as a pressure group to protect the rule of law. And I think in that light, that it's important to say that the NBA took a right decision. We haven't said that. I think that Mr. Rufai has opportunity 
even as the space is still provided, to defend himself, to, to say what he's doing in respect to Southern Kaduna. We need to see a stop to massacre in Southern Kaduna. We need to see the governor of Kaduna State do something about it. I'm not just in Kaduna State, in, across the country where there's huge insecurity. We need to see the government doing more to stop the, the, the massacre and the wastage of life across the country. It is, it is get, take, getting out of hand. Okay, since uh, uh, you, you are a member of the inner bar, uh, uh, let me ask you uh, for the concept and policy of fair hearing. Would you say MBA has given Mr. Arifa a fair hearing? Well, I, I, MBA has invited him. Uh, it's a prerogative. It's a privilege. And the NBA has said, well, we're sorry, we're no longer going to invite you because the majority of our members... But, but it does look like the NBA has made a judgment that Mr. Arufa is wrong. Well, NBA is not a body that is, on, that is putting Mr. Arufa on trial. NBA is a pressure group made up of members, 80,000 80, plus members. You, you said that the NBA has made a decision uh, and is majorly on, in the court of public opinion. And we know what that means. Even in court of public opinion, it shapes the lives of people. Do you think that the NBA has given Mr. Arufai fair hearing? Yes, well, I think the number of members of NBA has consistently demanded that something be done about certain Kaduna. But has he been given fair hearing? Well, he has been given an open space. There is a public space for him to do something about open uh, But Kaduna has space. the NBA, because NBA made a judgment that Mr. It does look like their judgment is Mr. Arufai is wrong and we are disinviting him. But has the NBA allowed him to be heard? NBA did not make a judgment. NBA simply made a statement. But that's a... Took, took a position. You took a position. Yes, that a position. You're a member of the neck of the NBA. Yes. And the decision after that meeting is the decision of the majority that Mr. Erufai is not worthy of your invitation because of some of the allegations against him. Yes. That misses a judgment. Well, no, it's not. It, NBA is not a court. NBA is a pressure group that has said what you're doing in Cardinal State does not accord with our principles, with our motto, with our uh, mission and vision. But, but, and but, therefore, we can't have it in our fold. And the NBA has a right to decide who comes to their conference and who does not come but to their But you said that uh, NBA had made a decision that matter in the court of public opinion. Because the because majority of Nigerian lawyers endorsed disinviting Mr. Erufai. And, and NEC, being a, being a democratic organization, took that decision for the majority. It was put onto, in, into vote, and majority of NEC members voted for, for disinviting him. Okay. So, so there's nothing anybody can do about that. The president cannot, even though, even though the president himself said that he voted for not disinviting him. But the majority of NEC members said so. So the fire laws in, in the court of public opinion, but that's a statement, not a judgment. It is a statement, an advocacy statement to show to Nigerian ruling class, the political society, that... There are people who are called lawyers in Nigeria who will not tolerate in impunity, who will not tolerate governors not doing what they are elected to do, and who will not tolerate just sitting back and allowing people being massacred, citizens being massacred. Nigerian lawyers has now made a point that we are not going to tolerate all that. Right. Not just with air fire, with all the executive members, the people in government, including the Attorney General of the Federation. Mm. Let me get a, a minute uh, comment from you. Uh, on the Kama Law, uh, the Communist and Allied Matters Act. Uh, Serap, as a body, has come out to say that that uh, assent should be revoked by the president. What's your take? Yes, I agree. I mean, well, not every part of the uh, Kama amended 2020 law that uh, acts that, um, in my opinion, offend the principle of rule of law and, uh, and, and, and human rights. I think the, the, the provision that allows the commission to deregister a pressure group like an NGO, like a religious body, is very arbitrary. Is it against uh, policy uh, of uh, standard uh, practice in, across some, uh, in some part that we see in some part of the world? Yeah, well, in some parts of the world, of course, in many, in many countries of the world, there are com commissions or committees or to deal with charities. And those are professional charity management bodies not a company registration body. Not a, a company, Kama is a company registration body. They don't have the competence to now look at into books of charities. If the law set up a charity commission, 
to look at proceedings of charity. That's the difference. Right. But to give the commission the power to deregister a charity is very arbitrary. And I think it goes, it closes the social All space right. for charities. Mr. Chena Obiago, thank you indeed for coming tonight and sharing your views on some of these issues that we've raised tonight. Everyone. And up next, the accusation and counter-accusation of allegations of planned violence ahead of the Edo governorship election generates controversies. We look deep into that after this time out, everyone. Join us again. Welcome back to the program, everyone. Don't forget to let us know what your views are on the issues that we're discussing tonight on the program. You can tweet to us on these handles that you're seeing right on your screen at CTV Politics and at Sean Walker on Twitter, hashtag uh, Sunday Politics or hashtag Politics Today. Or write to us. Our email is uh, politics today at chinastv.com. It's less than a month to the Edo State governorship election. But one thing that perhaps gives one some level of concern is the worry over possible violence. The different political parties, especially the top ones, the People's Democratic Party and the All Progressives Congress APC, have been accusing each other over plans to foment trouble. Let me introduce my panel to you and let's get started with the conversation and uh, from the different divides of, on this matter. Mr. Kenneth Imaswagbon is a chieftain of the People's Democratic Party. He's in our Buddha studio and from Benin City. He's a former member of the House of Assembly in a State, Honorable Henry Idahi Agbon. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming tonight on the program. Let's get uh, started on the conversation tonight and uh, perhaps... I should uh, uh, allow Mr. Maswagbon, uh, let me begin with you, uh, to listen to these uh, sound bites from the former governor of Edo State on the issue of violence when he visited the villa. Take a listen to Mr. Adams of Shemale after he visited the president, and this was what he said after uh, the, the meeting, the, the meeting they had. This was what he said after the meeting. Take a listen to him. So I shared this with Mr. President, and I said, oh, we don't need this. Good security. If APC man commit an offense, arrest him. If a PDP man commit an offense, arrest him. Once it is not about sermon, sermon do not change the heart of the devil. What changes the heart of men is the fear of sanction. And once one person is arrested from APC, another person is arrested from PDP if they are found involved in unlawful possession of firearms and they misuse those firearms and they are arrested and prosecuted, the message is clear. Mr. Maswagbo, what's your reaction to what uh, Mr. Uh, Oshamale has just said there? Uh, I know your party has been raising uh, issues about uh, plans of violence, but it does look, from what he said, it, it, there, there seems to be allegations and counter-accusations from both sides of the divide. Thank you, Shio, for having me on your program. God bless you, Sean, your family, and Chinese organization. Well, we know Oshomole. He says one thing, he means the other. If he says to you good morning, he means actually good night. The fact that he's saying that people that have the propensity to cause violence should be arrested means he's the person that wants to cause violence. He's a governor that we know for eight years. For example, Sean, Today, as we speak, we know that Governor Obaseki is a man of peace. He loves peace. He's a peaceful governor. If you go to Edo, I just came back from Benin to Abuja today. I'll be back tomorrow to, God willing, to Benin. All Governor Obaseki posters, majority, Oshomole and his men, APC, they go from at night, like night marauders, they tear and destroy posters of a sitting governor only because this man loved the way of peace. We are lucky in Edo to have a governor like Obaseki. However, if you look at Governor Shomole's history, he's a man that has lived all his life
fighting wars. He's a man of violence. You know, I have cried out to the world, to the police. I've cried out to the SSS. I've cried, cried out to the federal government, even to international organization, to America and many other countries. Dr. Shomala is having me on his assassination list. I mean every word I say. I now ask the world, and Oshomole, why would you want to assassinate Kennedy Masangmo, who in 2007 stepped down his political ambition, governorship ambition for you, when you just had one car? I stepped down after spending money. I stepped down my political ambition, governorship. Masangmo, let me ap apologize to you. Sorry, bosses. No, just just to just to bosses. clarify things because I'm just a moment. Own, no, I'm just hold on. Just please. hold on. Hold on, please. You, you, make, uh, you made an allegation, and a very strong one, that there is an attempt on your life. Uh, Can you clarify yes, what you mean by that? Is there evidence to it? Is there anything that you can show to justify what you've just said? Yes. One, all over, the deputy governor, the serving deputy governor, Felix Waibu, on credible intelligence, said there were meetings held by some Kogi people in Iyamu, in Governor Shomole's house, where some PDP leaders were marked on a hit list to be assassinated. The idea was cause confusion in those state, kill one or two, three PDP leaders. That would make INEC to say, look, we cannot not conduct this election under this atmosphere. And my name was listed as one of those to be assassinated. And I asked, why, why would Oshomole hold such a meeting in his house? Why would they enlist Kennedy Masa want to be assassinated? For employing Nigerians in Abuja and in the past 25 years teaching Nigerian children, for giving scholarship to men and women in uniform over 25 years, military, Navy, police officers, for sharing rights over the past 16 years, for paying hospital bills at the UBTH. Is that why you want to kill me for supporting Obaseki? Yes, I stepped down for Governor Obaseki. It is my choice. I do not have a regret. However, Shum, if we had a country, good country where things are done properly, people like me who have never done federal government contract, no state government contract, no government patronage. I should be given national honor rather than for people, people who never went to school to uh, wanting to kill me. But there is God, they can't kill me. God All is right. watching. Let me, let me, President Buhari is a good man, he's a father. He, I know he will not allow me to be killed. Our Americans are watching. I know I have strong ties with the United States of America. I cannot be killed. If All I'm right. killed, there will be consequence. When I say there will be consequence, I mean there will be consequence. So right. it is. So, Mr. Maswagbon, just a moment, just a moment, Mr. Maswagbon. No, so let me bring uh, the up for him. Yeah, this let me bring the other guest into the conversation. What he's doing. Honorable Udai Hagbon, let me bring you into the conversation. I'll allow you also to respond uh, to this uh, soundbite from the chairman of the PDP, uh, uh, Mr. Uche Sekundus. Take a listen to what he said, and I like I would like to hear your response on it. Plus and the chief of staff and the former chairman of APC. We have tensions in the north, tension northeast, northwest, everywhere. And yet, they are in the villa under the watch of Mr. President want to use the securities to climb down. Are we in police state? Those are strong allegations there, uh, Honorable Udai Hagbo. What would be your response? Well, thank you, Shim. Let me first correct uh, your introduction of my humble self. I have never been a member of the House of Assembly, and I do not plan to contest the election to the House of Assembly. I am deeply a past attorney general and consumer for justice and those things. The member of the House of Assembly. Um, before I, I respond directly to the standpoint that I've had the privilege of listening to, let me say that uh, the Emma Swagbon's book was 
Action National Television is something of the responsibility of the state that he ought to be. Uh, Adam Sushumali has been a man of ideas. He's an orator. He's a man of violence. I have not been associated with violence. Uh, my friend, uh, my friend, was very dwarf when he was done. And I took him up. He granted that interview of what political really part is the man who so in the politics to be deserving of an assassination. There's one who has never contested for cancellation. He has never been cancelled. He has never been anything. So nobody is planning to uh, assassinate any let alone Kennedy Pacheco. He just crying wolf. As to the reckless statement of the, the PDP National Chairman, which is the Congress, let me say very clearly, and I'm some of them make it clear after meeting with Mr. President, that anybody that is engaged in any violence during the process leading up to and on election day in the state should be fairly treated by the law without any fear of labor. Even if the person is an APC member. That's how a statesman should I belong to the school of thought, and I shared with the former president, Jonathan, that no election is what the blood of any citizen, whether of the state or of the country. And our party, the APC, we are a peaceful party. When PDP went to pay a first call on the other of Benin, and then they brought their talk because Capelosa Akumbo was there, Seven members of the PDP were arrested by the police in Edo. We are still waiting for the arraignment in court today. That they are here to do. So the violent party is the state is the PDP. It's the Redeemer Zagos Party and not the FTC. So they should stop crying wolf. The deputy governor has addressed the press conference uh, claiming that some people are going to be assassinated. That is precisely their plan. I, that am speaking to you now, I am a survivor of the assassination plan by, by, by the governor on the 30th of January 2020. I think that's 77 bullet holes in my office at Silicon Road in Benin City, broad daylight, 1.30 p.m. So, the PDP are trying to get the state. Yeah, there have been tension here and there. The tension has been caused by the PDP. The APC is a peaceful party. Our candidate is a man of peace, is a man of God, a pastor, he is now a redeemed church of God. And we are going about our campaign peacefully. Yesterday, we were in, the local, in the local government, we went to several places. There was not a single incident. The PDP went to Igwebe. There were no uh, people to work on them at Igwebe. They started shooting into the air and caused commotion. They went to the north, shot. There's not a single shot in all our APC campaign. And we have traversed the length and breadth of the 18 local government. So, who is the aggressor here? Who is the violent party here? All right. So let me uh, go back to Abuja and uh, the issue of um, uh, performance and uh, ideas that are going to be shared in this election are very critical. Uh, before I do that, uh, I wanted to listen to what uh, the candidate of the APC said about the situation in Edo State. This is Pastor Ize Yamu talking about the state of roads in Edo State. Take a listen to him. There are no roads. You can see the kind of detour we have to take to get here. There's no water. There's no light. No new schools. No support from government. No hospital. So they are more or less on their own. Uh, abandoned, so to speak. And uh, my coming here is just to assure them that because I know their problems, because I live among them, we will ensure by their votes and by government, will be able to solve them. You heard what the candidate of the APC said about the state of things in Edo State. Does he give you some jitters as a member of the PDP in the campaign? Well, uh, Sean, Governor Basaki is a marvel, is a genius. We've never had it in Edo since this republic. Among all the governors, Obaseke has been the finance, he's a guru, a financial expert. Look at what he has done with Rose. This is a governor, Governor Obaseke. He has made or created 350 roads in Edo. Only four days ago, he was in my village during his war tour. 
I had the privilege of, for the first time in my life, commissioning a road under the grace of Governor Obaseki. In education, he's a perfect governor. He's been able to retrain teachers. Teacher salaries are paid as at when due. Roof of schools that Oshomole couldn't do. Obaseki have done major schools. Our schools today is modern and tailored through a modern ICT school system. Teachers are happier now. The teachers of Edo State, they are going to, they are going to vote for Obaseki massively. Pensioners that Oshomole could not pay for eight years. Today, as I speak, we, adult pensioners are ready to pay back during the election to pay the good work of Obaseki in paying their pensions areas that were owned, owned by Oshomole's administration. Obaseki have cleared all those. Hospitals, what about the hospitals? We've got the best hospitals today in Edo State. In the 192 wards, show every ward in Edo State, Obaseki have an hospital, a clinic, modern clinic today in 192 wards. He has been able to do that. What about attracting investors to Edo? The Azura plant, the Oshomo plant. What about the uh, refinery, the modular refinery? Creating over 10,000 jobs at completion. He's been able to, able to bring Chinese. He's been able to bring international uh, uh, companies to trigger the development and lay a formidable foundation for a new Edo. For Baseki, what we are seeing is a huge blessing. He doesn't make noise about it. He's a gentleman who does his job silently. While if, in the days of Oshomole, if he ties one kilometer road, he will get all the press and be shouting and be walking on the streets. A man for eight years who never did anything in Edo State. Unlike an Obaseku is performing, but he's not making noise. My, 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 my take and my thanksgiving to my creator is that I'm grateful to God that I can imagine going supporting Obaseki rather than a violent party or led by Oshomole, rather than a party that has failed the door people. You will see the result. We are going to defeat APC 80 right. to 20 so, percent. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Maso Agbon, going... let, let again uh, uh, allow uh, Honorable Idai Agbon to come back to the conversation. Honorable Idai Agbon, I'd like you to respond to what uh, uh, Mr. Maso Agbon <laughs> had to say, but take a listen to uh, what uh, Godwin, uh, Governor Godwin Obaseki said about the situation and the performance. Take a listen to Governor Godwin Obaseki in a moment. In Edo today, you have more electricity than we can consume. The problem we have is distribution. So this is our second term. We will now make sure that that light, that electricity, which we're already generating in Edo, gets to every home in Edo State. So, Honorable Dayagma, your response on what the governor said on that podium and what Mr. Emaswagma said too. You see, the, the, Mr. Emaswagma does not live in the two states. He lives in Abuja and then in Washington, D.C. The Edo state described by Emaswagma just now before Nigerian people is the Edo state of Emaswagma's dreams. Not the Edo state where I live in. I don't live in Abuja and I don't live in Washington. That Obaseki has built clinic in 192 wards, that he has started 350 roads. I challenge Ima Swagbo and I challenge his governor to name 10 out of the 350 roads. In Metropolitan Benin City, Obaseki has started only three roads. The first is Lucky Way by Ramat Park in Ikboba Hill. The second is Iriri Road, linking Airport Road to Sapele Road. The third is a hikeman and television road, it's one straight road. Those are the three completed roads in metropolitan Benicity. I was born here. I have never lived outside of this place, and I'm here. I slept beneath yesterday, and I will sleep here this night. The fourth road is a camera road and is abandoned. There are pockets of lanes and avenues in the GROA, done with C4 and NDDC. That is all. No other road. I challenge him to mention roads, to mention the streets. I have mentioned streets. 
It was the campaign program of a uh, 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 campaign promise of Governor Obaseki that he will build clinics in the 192 wars. In fact, he said a is a campaign is dumb. The only politician that can compare with Obaseki the entire wide world is pre President Donald Trump. Obaseki went to Okpila. The people of Okpila deliberately took him to, through the worst roads to the venue of their rally. And when he got there, he said, oh, this road is very bad. If I don't tie it in the next two years, if you vote for me, don't call me governor again. Why would they call you other than governor? He went to Ilushi. He said, for the past five years, and that's Kalitima's uh, most local government. He said, for the past five, five years, you people don't have electricity. I will give you. He forgets that for the past five years, four years of it, he was the governor. Obaseki is just is a scam. He came to call the people. He's a con man. L let me allow Mr. Maswagbo to react to what you have said tonight about the performance of the governor. You've mentioned the issue of electricity, the refinery, and the issue of the hospital. Mr. Maswagbo, how do you react to those? Uh, uh, you know, my friend Idagbo, his comments are laughable. The risk, the risk karma is Oshomole, APC, and their candidate. I, I find it difficult at times. I wonder why we Nigerians don't appreciate nice people like Obaseki. He's a man that is committed to adult development. My friend, my friend, the Dagbon's pain is that Obaseki coming has changed the narrative of sharing the money. He refused to give money to politicians. He said, look, I want to do work for the ordinary adult people. And he's doing the job. Obaseki is a huge blessing. Never in the history of politics since 1999 have we seen a performing governor like Obaseki. I'll tell you, Shio, in area of roles, in my world, he's done two roles. In my local government, he's done over 12 roles. I have followed him over 80 something worse now. We've been campaigning, Chris Cotton, we are campaigning. Come and see the approval of Edo people. <laughs> the problem with APC, they cannot stomach that they are going to lose this election. Each time they see the followership, the accept acceptance of Basaki have against a, a drowning godfather who runs to Abuja, believing that President Buhari, with all what he has done to Nigeria, will because of a Shomole cause bloodshed and, and use the military to rig election. Buhari is not going to do that. I can promise that. Buhari will choose to be in history, to, to, to write his name down in gold than to allow Shomole and APC frustrated people in Edo. The risk come out today is Shomole and his APC people in Edo. They cannot even phantom that, oh, we are losing. PDP was in opposition for 12 years in Edo. We did not die. Shomole was in opposition during Jonathan. We did not die. Jonathan allowed Shomole and he won 18 local government. Look. No, if or someone they like, and make a token for pidgin English, make it bring the whole, even American army, Nigerian army. General Brutai, I love you. I love you. I knew you as a major. I know your thoughts. I know your values. You will not succumb to or someone antics. Allow the will of the people to prevail, though that is the only way forward for the country. To so allow Nigeria now to have crisis in Edo because of Oshomole and because the Isaiah Mu must be governor. Alba, God is watching, oh. We are though, we are waiting, oh. We will wait for the INEC. INEC, we are waiting. We are waiting for you to do what is right so that at the end of the day, Professor Mahmoud, you, when you, the day you will die, you will meet with your God and you say, oh, I did, I fought a good fight for Nigeria. Like Jaga have done. Today, Jaga is a hero because he did the right thing. INEC, military, police, IG, do the right thing. All right. If Obaseki loses in a free and fair election, I will be the first person to tell him you fought a good fight. All right. Let me allow Mr. Adair to come back into the conversation. And now, let's do some analysis now. 
just a moment, Mr. Maswagbon. Uh, I'd like you to react to what some of the issues that have been raised here as regarding issues of violence and some of the allegations against uh, the leader of your party, Adam Soshomali. But look at what happened in 2016. The APC candidate then, who is now the PDP candidate, uh, Godwin Obaseki, won the election with 52% of the vote. Uh, with your candidate, who is now the APC candidate, it was then the PDP candidate, winning with 41%. What do you think could happen this time around? From your own analysis, I know you're a strategist also, Honorable Idaya. I am. And uh, people like, uh, like uh, Kenneth Maswak, well, they are big politicians when we talk. The baby, yes, uh, it's, uh, it's just been garrulous. Let me tell you, uh, Oba Sekin winning in, with 52% in 2016 shows the strength of Pastor Sagi Zayamu, our candidate. Pastor Sagi Zayamu has been the issue in those state politics since the beginning of this republic in 1999. I have said it before, and let me repeat it here. If there are 100 former political office holders in those state today, Osage Zemo has been responsible and has contributed mostly directly and sometimes indirectly to at least 80% of them attaining whether elective or, or appointive uh, uh, office. And in spite of the fact that Oshomole was a sitting governor, in spite of the fact that Oshomole worked, the only governor you can compare Oshomole with in those state is Ogbemudi and Professor Ambrose Ali. Oshomole is generally referred to as the apostle of development in those state. In spite of all that, we could only defeat Pastor Isaac Zayamu then with just 52 to 48 percent. Let me tell you now, that guy making him out there, he probably will not be in his, his village is called AKK quarters in Ubiaja. He probably will not be there on September 19th to vote because he will be in Abuja, he will be in Washington, D.C. When coronavirus started, he ran to Washington, D.C. because he thought it was going to kill all of us here in Africa, in Nigeria. Thank God he didn't kill us. Now, as we speak, the election, they just, if you ask me to rate it objectively, 70, 30 percent. 70 percent as we speak to date for Pastor Sage Zayamu, and we intend to ramp it up to 80 percent before the election, and a paltry and miserly 20 percent of Governor Obaseki. In every local government he has gone to, in fact, the people of uh, uh, Eastern Southeast, Ubiaja as capital, they will not allow Kennedy Masuagmo to enter their local government. I haven't lied on national television that he has started uh, 12 roads in his local government and two in, uh, in his ward. I am from a local government. It is one of the three metropolitan local governments in Edo State. I have been an elected council chairman of that local government. Obaseki has not graded one road. As we speak, Pastor Sage Zeyamu, who is just a candidate, had to send caterpillars and bulldozers to my own ward one to be grading the roads in order to allow people to be able to move. And then you are telling me the man left Metropolitan Benin to go to Ubiaja, to go after 14 rows? That must be in your imagination. Let me tell you, the pastor has a simple agenda. Because of his deep involvement in governance issues, and he has had the opportunity to reflect on governance issues in Edo State, he came out with an agenda. It's a document with which you can reckon his performance by the time he's elected by the grace of God come September 19. The S of the simple, right. the, the so first uh, Honorable Dayagbo, uh, because let's let's spend the last few minutes that we have to allow Mr. Emaswagbo uh, to react to you. Uh, if you look at the result of the 2016 election in Igweben, Oredo, and Orion, one, it was a very very tough battle in 2016, with sometimes 1,000 less than a thousand uh, votes uh, between the two major candidates. That is uh, Ozageze Yamu and uh, uh, Godwin Obaseki. He said that they're going to beat your party 70% to 30%. What is your analysis of how this election uh, is going to pan out? So this is laughable still. You know, the pain of my friend, the dark boy, is that he cannot phantom that they are losing power. I pity him all over since we left school. He's always been around corridors of power. He, he, he leaks or some less uh, wounds and feet. He can say anything on national telly. I create jobs. I build jobs. I'm from the private sector. I have contributed to Nigeria more than a, a serving governor. But let's leave that. I will not talk to him. However, on Obaseki, Obaseki is set to win. The other person leading the charge of APC is a no scammer. When I say a scammer, 
a political for one night and a godfather kneeling down. See Osho Mole, kneeling down. They are begging. Now all their tricks have failed. They have resorted to kneeling, begging. And the people are saying, no, our bumu don't reach. We not go agree. We want to basically who said, who have said, no, I would rather give the money to the people to develop hospitals, schools, make our, our create jobs, make life for the ordinary, the weak people. Look, let me tell you, Shehu, and the world knows. I will just go around the, the world tour. The people have made up their mind. While we are doing world campaign, they don't even have the audacity to go to the wars. They are running to President Buhari and Ainek, to Abuja. They don't know Ainek, Abuja, those are games of the past. The game of the present that democracy is the people's business. We in Edo, we are resolved. We the people of Edo do hereby declare that we want democracy. Buhari wants democracy. The army wants democracy. That Professor Mahmoud will allow democracy rather than to allow Oshomole and others to write results. If you ever write results, we will not accept it. I wouldn't accept it. My, I don't want to reply my friend because I understand his frustration. A man who has created one job in his life, moving from one government to the other and leaking their wounds. I can talk because I'm a builder of the Nigerian economy. I create, I have over 700 graduates under my payroll. All I right. pay taxes. I go so, to Mr. Washington. Maso, I, want, we, I we, take we, we, these kids we, of Washington yeah. and bring it back to Abuja. We, we have to leave it at that, gentlemen. Connecting up a couple from Oshomole and All others. Right. All right. We shall see. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kenneth Umaso Agbon, Chieftain of the yeah. PDP, and as well as uh, so, Honorable Henry. Yeah, my, my junior as a lawyer. And you that have practiced for over 10 years. Can I see what has never won We're out of camp. time, <laughs> and we're out of time, and we need to close the program now. Uh, Honorable Henry Idai Agbon and uh, Mr. Kenneth Imaswa Agbon. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your talk tonight. And that's our show for today. Everyone, many thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day.